So, so now we're going we're, we're gonna to have, have some local folks who are, who are regional thinkers and leaders uh, respond to what they've heard this morning. And this is, a, this is a great panel of people. We can just bring them one at a time. And by the way, at lunch, we'll have the whole panel up here, everybody who's still here. Uh, we'll, we'll take questions and discuss things uh, back and forth and so on. So uh, our first local speaker here is going to be Michael Emerson, who is the co-director of, uh, of the Kinder Institute. And, and thank you, Michael. Here we go. I think there's a first uh, conference I've been to that was actually everything was running early, so I have a task here. These were uh, tremendous uh, presentations. And I, what, what, what I want to do with my task, because there are four of us, is rather than commenting on them specifically, I want to couch them uh, as my role as an uh, urban sociologist into talking a little bit about a, a broader view of cities. So, for example, we have 3% uh, of our entire land in the United States that is sent for our urban areas. But in that 3% of land lives 82% of our people, <laughs> over a quarter of a billion people. Why do people move to cities? Cities have always been and will continue to be engines of innovation. That's economic, that's knowledge, that's fashion, that's arts, that's technological innovation that we heard about today, smart growth. The reason is because when you put a lot of people together, they bump into each other and they start sharing ideas and they start thinking in new ways. And when you put subcultures and diversity together, which is what cities always have, creation happens. So, a city really, if we want to define it, or a metropolitan area, is the absence of space between people, jobs, commerce, culture. The more absence of space, the more city you have. So, when you put all this together, some amazing things happen. These are almost the laws of cities, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, for one, when you have a large metropolitan area of a million or more, it will be 50% more productive than smaller areas, measured by things like GDP output. Not 50% more overall, but in total per person. On average, if you raise a nation's share of its urban by 10%, its economic output will increase 30%. So if you want to make a country wealthy, urbanize it. What is more, whenever a metro size doubles, every measure of economic activity increases 15% per capita. Every measure. So we become 15% wealthier every time we double a metro. And you know what? There seems to be no limit. If you doubled New York metro, everybody's wealth and productivity would increase by an additional 15% per capita. Likewise, if we think about the city and the indicators of what we may look at, if it's like an organism, the metabolism, the same thing happens. As a metro size doubles, the number of gas stations, the total surface roads that are devoted, number of power lines, sewer miles, the heat that we consume in our homes and businesses in the winter, the air conditioning we use, increases by only 85%. So the bigger we get, the more efficient we become. This occurs every time a metro doubles, the city doubles, again, no matter how big it seems to get. But you can alter these relationships based on the form of the city, the, the shape of it, and particularly the transportation system it relies on. So I want to give you just a couple examples of that. So if we have the old time walking cities, like uh, a lot of Europe, if you've ever been to central Florence or any, most any other place in Europe, you find you have very narrow winding streets with shops in tight proximity to one another. Even you might say they're crammed in. Then you can look at uh, a next stage of development with trains. We call them the train elevator cities. Chicago, New York are good examples of these. People move around in those ways. Instead of winding narrow roads, the streets get wider, but they become grids for more efficient movement. They have high density and uh, office space tends to be put up in the air. Shops stay down on the bottom. Then you have metros based on cars, and Houston is a shining example of that. Uh, you get enormous roads if you've ever gone from here on 10 out to Katy now. There are places when you include the uh, feeder roads that we have 24 lanes going and people moving. So you make these vast roads to move people around. Uh, few sidewalks and commerce tends to be found in malls and in uh, scattered site office 
complexes. Car-based suburban metros have some advantages. I want to point those out. One is people get more space. Two is speed. This is interesting. Average commute in the US if you drive a car is 24 minutes. If you live in a metropolitan area, the average commute if you take public transportation is 48 minutes. It takes twice as long. So you can see, as long as we have that gap, people are going to tend to favor the car given the present circumstances. But cities are by far humanity's greenest creation. So if you want to be truly environmentally friendly, we will push for more and more cities, far more than rural areas, more than suburbs. I'll give you an example, just one. A typical person in Manhattan that lives there emits 14,000 fewer pounds of carbon dioxide annually than does a person living in the New York suburbs. I'll say that again, a typical person in Manhattan emits 14,000 fewer pounds of carbon dioxide annually than does the person living in the New York suburbs. And if we compare the people in Manhattan to people living in Houston suburbs, it's even wider because there's less ability to take trains and buses in the suburbs here. Um, the environmental costs of car-based metros is so vast that government policies have to put the brakes on it. Car-based living imposes vast environmental costs on the entire planet. There's a book that came out recently by an economist at Harvard, Ed Glazer. Uh, I think he has this soft little title of, called The Triumph of Cities. And he went around the world, been studying cities for most of his life. He came here, he got uh, tours of Houston, spent quite a bit of time here. He devotes part of a chapter on Houston to what other cities can learn because as the fastest growing metropolitan area in the US, he wanted to know why. Given our heat, our climate, things like why are people by the millions coming here? And his conclusion is cheap housing. That if you're a middle class family, this is the best place to live. Your money goes the furthest. All right, so he has many positive things to say about Houston, but in terms of its sustainability, I'm going to read to you word for word what he says. If the entire world started looking like Houston, and I'll put in that what he meant is low density, huge proportion of single family homes, car based, the planet's carbon footprint will skyrocket. Houston residents are some of the biggest car carbon emitted emitters in the world. All those 90 degree days and all that humidity mean that Houston is a ravenous consumer of electricity. All that driving gobbles and gobbles and gobbles. So what are some takeaways from implications of this? First, large dense uh, cities based on walking, biking, and tr public transportation are the true friends of the environment. I noticed from Allison's presentation that if I saw it right, in Europe the most environmental friendly city according to your ranking is Copenhagen? Yes, okay. So I'm going to be actually living next year in Copenhagen and part of what I'll be doing there is studying how they went from being a Houston of congestion back in the 1960s with cars filling everything to today only 5% of people there get to work in a car. Um, so they've made a major changes, and they uh, just recently opened the world's first superhighway that's only for bicycles. So there's suburban people come in on, on bicycles. It's amazing. We need to end policies that subsidize home ownership and highways and low density. It, part of the reason that America looks the way it does is because our federal government and our state governments <laughs> encourage suburbanization. They've seen that as a positive thing. That's the American dream. If we want to be uh, sustainable, we're going to have to change that. Even though that's going to be controversial, there is an easy way to do it. And this, of course, is a very economist view of how you do that. You let people make choices, but they have to pay for those choices. So um, consider this. Um, in research by Glazer, who I was telling you about, and his colleague Khan, they found that if you move from low to high gas tax, raise the tax on your gallon of gas, the density of development in a metro increases on average by 40%. So they just classified uh, all gas taxes into two categories. If it moves from being low to high, all of a sudden people make choices to want to have more dense development and come closer together. So the, the issue is that you can charge people. So we've heard um, from some of these presentations, Stockholm, Singapore, Oslo, London, 
They've created these systems that the more traffic congestion, the more people must pay. So they can still be in it, but they're going to have to pay more for it. And you get the expected result. More people decide, I don't want to pay for it, so I'm not going to contribute to the congestion. Uh, so people who like suburbs should be able to live there, but it should be based on the true cost of the suburbanization. Again, I love economists because they can actually tell you the true cost. $2.30 per gallon of gas used. So you, anybody for each additional gallon of gas used, the tax to cover that should be $2.30 above our, what are we paying now, $3.50 per gallon. So that would then cover the additional cost of trying to create technologies to treat the additional uh, waste that's going into the air because of the driving. So ultimately, if we are going to be sustainable, environmentally, economically, socially, we must become more city-like. And thank you very much. <laughs>